It can be seen in lupus and Sjogren's and a variety of autoimmune diseases. And then um, the one myositis-related antibody that was tested was JO1, because that's the most common one that we see, and that was negative as well. So really, when I saw him, there was not necessarily any suspicion that he had myositis, or even if he had an autoimmune disease. This is his chest x-ray, which um, it's hard because I didn't put a normal one up here, but all these sort of white, fluffy, patchy changes in this dark background are abnormal. It really should be fairly dark, except for the ribs and the lung field. So, and it's on both sides, so it's a very, what we would call a diffuse or widespread process. It's not focal, and, and I just bring it up because normally in pneumonia, most pneumonia is one-sided, not both sides, and usually kind of an area of what we call consolidation. So this really isn't typical for most bacterial pneumonia, pneumonias. And this is um, a CAT scan sort of taken at cross-section through the base of the lungs. And I know that because this is the diaphragm, the base of the lungs. But again, we see that these sort of small, patchy white areas which represent what we call ground glass pacification. And that is very different from so-called honeycombing, which is, that's just what it sounds like. Um, and when we see honeycombing, that's usually indicative of fibrosis or scarring. So this patient really did not have that. We, we know that myositis certainly is a systemic disease. It's not just a disease of muscle. It's not just a disease of lungs. So when we see patients, we, of course, want to know what's going on everywhere else. Um, we'd like to think that we're dealing with the whole person and not just an organ. Um, and, and really, it's fairly unremarkable. He didn't report any fevers, chills, unexplained weight loss, didn't have what we call ray nodes or circulatory disturbance where the blood vessels um, go into spasm strict, usually triggered by cold exposure. Really didn't report any skin rashes other than um, what he thought were sort of calluses over his hands, and because he actually works as a mechanic, it didn't, it didn't stand out as being that abnormal to him. Um, he, at the time that I saw him, really, even from a pulmonary standpoint, had very little, very few symptoms. He had no cough. And shortness of breath, he was able to get through his work day without any difficulty. He didn't report any problems swallowing, which can be a big issue because that can be a setup for what we call aspiration or basically having contents of the stomach come up and then go, or when you're eating anyway, things going down the wrong way. Or um, he also didn't have any reflux, which can cause the opposite problem, things coming up from below which can end up in the lung, particularly at night when we can't protect our airway. And no joint symptoms, pain, swelling, stiffness, and really no muscle weakness. He, he, when pressed, he said, well, I have a little bit of aching in my shoulder muscles, but nothing that he uh, paid too much attention to. His examination was for the most part, also unremarkable, though, as I'll show you in a second, there were some subtle things that I noticed that ultimately, I think, helped make his diagnosis, but he had no fever, he had no blood pressure, he had no abnormal swelling of lymph nodes. Even his lung exam was fairly uh, unremarkable, good air movement, he didn't have what we call crackles or abnormal sounds indicative of fluid or inflammation or scarring didn't have any swelling in his joints or synovitis. He had good strength on examination. Uh, and didn't really have any of uh, some of the more classic or characteristic skin rashes, which we might see with things like dermatomyositis. So didn't have Gokrim's rash or papules, which um, for those of you who have dermatomyositis, you know this already, but that's a rash which is typically on elbows or knees or knuckles and very characteristic period, but he didn't have any of that. What he did have, though, um, was, I think, some unusual findings on his hands. So I think, hopefully, you can appreciate that 
there's actually some discoloration of the hands here and at the base of his fingers. Really, right where you would do calluses, actually, but it's a little darker. But the thing that was more striking to me is this sort of furrowing or fissuring, cracking of the fingertips, um, which ironically we call mechanics hands. And, you know, it's a little easier when you see it in somebody who's actually not a mechanic. Um, but so, but he, he basically said, you know, this is new. This is not something, I've worked as a mechanic for years and I really haven't had this. So basically the summary of this presentation or this, this case is that this is a gentleman with a known history of interstitial lung disease based on his earlier presentation and some abnormalities on imaging studies. Currently, relatively asymptomatic, but he does have evidence of what we would call mechanics hands on examination, no muscle weakness. And then his labs, as I alluded to before, um, the ANA, there should be a negative. It was negative, so it was Joe 1. The only antibody that he had was this non specific antibody. But what he did have, and, and really is commonly not reported, is what we call a cytoplasmic stain pattern. So on ANA testing. So normally when your blood is sent to the lab for ANA or antinuclear antibody, what they're doing is they take a component of the blood, the serum, and they mix it or they put it over a slide with cells on top of it, and then they look at the fluorescent marker and they're literally looking to see if your antibodies are staining the nucleus of the cell, the central part of the cell. And technically, this person had a negative ANA, but had they looked more closely, what they would have seen is that the rest of the cell, the fluid around the nucleus, which is called the cytoplasm, was very much lighting up. So that's all this sort of green here that you can see. And that can be an important clue, especially when we don't have the ability to send for all the fancy antibodies and lab tests like JO1 because the targets of antibodies like JO1 are actually located in that part of the cell, not in the nucleus. So in fact, it's very common to have a negative ANA, but when we look more closely, we can see these unique antibodies. Um, and the clue to that, again, can be the stain pattern when we do the ANA testing. So bottom line is the diagnosis that we ultimately made was that this patient had what we call the antisympathase syndrome, but an incomplete form because he didn't have active myositis, arthritis, fever, some of the other components that we see in that syndrome. So that really is meant to be a backdrop for our discussion of lung involvement in the setting of myositis. But it's very important to keep in mind that the lung can actually be involved in many different ways in myositis. So the focus of that case and what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes really is interstitial lung disease, where the lung tissue itself is involved or affected by inflammation, sometimes by scarring. And I would, I would sort of classify that more generally as an intrinsic lung disease. But there's all these other factors which can contribute or impact lung in, in the setting of myositis. So for example, we don't think about this, but the, we, we have muscles that control breathing that enable us to expand our rib cage so we take in air. And in people with severe myositis, those muscles can be equally affected. So, that really is a problem with ventilation. It's not the lung tissue itself necessarily that's affected, but it's the ability, the mechanics of the lungs that are impaired. As I mentioned before, we always worry about aspiration, which means food or stomach contents, contents going into the lungs and causing sort of a chemical burn or a chemical inflammation. Infection is also always um, something that we have to remain vigilant for when um, the lung is impaired that can affect its ability actually to clear infection. Plus, many people 
as you know, with myositis and lung disease are medications which partially suppress or block the immune system, which increases susceptibility to infection. So, you know, if we think about symptoms, cough, and shortness of breath, those are pretty non-specific. Like, there's no way you can tell the difference between myositis, lung disease, and infection based on that symptom alone, except that the cough and infection is much more likely to be productive of yellow, green, phlegm, all the things you don't want to hear about after breakfast. Um, these other issues, fortunately, are, are rarely a complication, but we still need to think about them. So heart failure is not common in setting of myositis, at least directly related to myositis. And it's surprising in some ways that the heart, because it's related to skeletal muscle, not the same, but the heart it is usually not directly or at least significantly affected in myositis. So we don't see heart failure as a direct complication of myositis, usually. And then pulmonary artery hypertension refers to changes in the blood vessels in the lungs that um, can rarely be a secondary complication. So this is a bit of a, a laundry list, but it's still important to keep in mind that not all lung disease in myositis is actual interstitial lung disease or inflammation of the lung tissue. If, a few details here, but I think very relevant and important for you to, to understand that this is a conservative estimate, but probably 30 to 75 percent of patients with myositis have some form of lung disease. That doesn't mean it's symptomatic, doesn't mean it's going to be progressive to start formation, but part of this is a problem of definition, but if we were to do CAT scans on everybody with diagnosis of myositis, we would see at least radiographic evidence of subtle lung involvement in at least 75% of patients. And we, there are studies that, that show that that's true. So basically, the lung is the most commonly involved organ outside of the muscle in, in myositis. If we look at this from a somewhat different perspective and say, if we consider all the patients who have interstitial lung disease in myositis, probably three quarters of them will have these antibody markers against Joe one or one of the related um, synthetase um, proteins. And that, that's, again, part of the antisynthetase syndrome, which I'll touch on briefly in a moment again. But I think this is a key point here, and it's really a key point for physicians who see patients with myositis, that the lung disease can precede muscle involvement. So this presents a challenge. There are many people with lung disease who don't first stop at the rheumatologist or the neurologist's office because they have myositis. They start with lung problems, and so they see the pulmonologist. And unless there is a, a fairly high index of suspicion for the possibility of an associated autoimmune disease, then the, the attribution, the cause, can be missed. Um, and that's not to cast blame, because this is not a trivial issue um, to make these diagnoses. But it, it is important, because of this point, that unfortunately, especially when we're talking about more severe forms of lung involvement, there's a, a, a negative impact on not only quality of life, but frankly, on survival. So the survival rates for myositis in general um, are pretty good, all things considered. Um, but when there's coexisting lung disease, then we see some dip in the survival. So in, in um, sort of epidemiologic terms, we talk about five-year survival. Um, and it can go down as low as 70%. But that depends, again, in part on what type of lung disease. So that's not to say that if you had a CAT scan that shows some changes that you have only a 70% survival rate. I don't want anybody leaving the room thinking that that's what I'm saying. Um, but this is really also another key point related to what I said before, is that we can't really use what's going on in the muscle or skin um, as a barometer of what's happening in the lung, because it's almost like there's a disconnect. I mean, you would think 
you know, it would make sense if the severity of lung disease would vary with the severity of everything else, but that's not really true. So again, from a physician perspective, um, we have to remain very vigilant and always look for um, the activity of disease in the lung, even if everything else is seemingly well controlled and quiet. So what are the symptoms? Uh, this isn't really rocket science. People who have lung problems are going to have shortness of breath. Cough, although typically if it's not an infection, if it's related to the disease, it's usually non-productive, meaning that there's not a lot of phlegm or sputum production. Unlike other autoimmune diseases such as lupus, it's much less common to get pleurisy or pain, pleuritic pain, or fluid around the lungs, what we call pleural effusion. It can happen, particularly in myositis overlap syndromes, but it's, it's not common. <laughs> and, and what we see here is basically that there are a variety of ways in which the lung problems can manifest, and really they kind of represent different possible disease courses. So for example, one common scenario is that the lung disease is completely asymptomatic, and it's really discovered incidentally. Somebody has a CAT scan of the abdomen for an unrelated problem, they get a few, you know, a portion of the base of the lungs that's included in that study, and the radiologist astutely notices that there are changes in the lung tissue at the bases, but that patient may never have symptoms and, or has symptoms or may never develop symptoms. I think the most more typical course is that once lung disease is detected that there is a chronic but slowly progressive course if not recognized and treated. And then rarely, fortunately, this is rare, but there can be a really fulminant um, drop off in lung function, really life-threatening complication, which we call ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, in which the inflammation and the change in the lung just uh, progress very, very rapidly. And, um, that's much more difficult to treat. Um, and part of that's because of the rapid time course. There's not a lot of lead time. Someone can be seemingly perking along and doing fine, and then all of a sudden something seems to take this you know, terrible downturn of lung function. So how do we make the diagnosis of lung disease? I think first and foremost, Clinical suspicion is important, um, especially again in that scenario where someone doesn't have no myositis or doesn't have a, a recognized underlying disease process and they present with cough and shortness of breath to the pulmonologist. Uh, it really, you have to think about these things to really make the correct diagnosis in those situations. We do have tools at our disposal that help, certainly imaging studies, and the, the most sensitive that I think valuable tool is the so-called high-resolution CAT scan or HRCT. We use pulmonary function tests to measure not only the mechanics of the lungs, um, but also to look at things like oxygen transfer. Um, or gas transfer, because that's basically how oxygen gets from the environment into the blood so that it can go to the tissues. So there are ways that we can objectively measure that. And that's important not only for diagnostic purposes, but really also for monitoring purposes. And then there are certain situations where we do advocate a lung biopsy that certainly is not necessary in all cases. Um, and very often when we do a biopsy, it's not so much to establish the diagnosis of myositis and associated lung disease, but to rule out other mimickers, infection or rarely malignancy, something else that we wouldn't want to miss um, and then treat it appropriately with immune suppressing drugs. We've already had a, a you know, we've already talked a little bit about the utility of antibodies in helping us make the diagnosis and also really 
um, predicting prognosis. So Joe one is probably it is the most common antibody detected in myocytes in general, and particularly when you look at um, myocytes especially with lung disease, it's by far the most common. But there are other antibodies here in the same family of the synthetases. And one thing to notice is that if you look at where these antibodies occur with respect to polymyositis, PM, or dermatomyositis, or what we call overlap syndromes, you'll notice that some of these antibodies can sort of cross those boundaries. And it's significant because we used to think that sort of the most important determinant of, of disease and disease, disease course is, you know, whether you had poly or dermatomyositis. But it's clear that if you can have a syndrome like the antisynthetase syndrome associated with this antibody, then maybe that's the more important feature of the disease, or at least predictor of the disease course, uh, rather than whether, or rather than if, if you have you know, the skin findings that separate dermatomyositis from polymyositis. So there really is, um, I think, an important role for looking at these antibodies uh, in understanding, better understanding the disease process, and as I said before, helping to um, determine prognostic information. So this is a very busy slide, very technical. Um, I'm not going to test you on it. Um, but it's meant just to illustrate that um, if we look at the various antibodies that we might find in myositis, some of these are very commonly associated with lung disease. So we can, even if people who present with myositis who don't have overt lung involvement, by knowing the antibody status, we know who to look out for. Um, and the CADM140, the other name for that is MD85, which um, some people may have heard of. But again, the most common one is Joe one which is the poster child of the antisynthetase syndrome. And so if we look at the, um, how frequently or how often we see the antibodies in myositis, we see that um, 20 to 30 percent of the time, Joe one will be present, which is actually more common than all the other antisynthetase antibodies put together. And you'll notice that you know, they all have these um, abbreviations, and that's because uh, they're, in many cases, named after the first individual in whom they were described. So collectively, Joe one and these other um, antibodies which target proteins called synthetases uh, constitute or mark the antisynthetase syndrome, which in its full expression is characterized by fever, muscle involvement, joint involvement, Raynaud's, the circulatory disturbance, these very sort of characteristic skin lesions that we term colloquially mechanics hands, and then of course interstitial lung disease. And in many cases, um, as in the case that I presented, uh, the lung is the organ that's predominantly involved and maybe solely involved. So that um, it's very important, particularly for pulmonologists, to recognize the possibility of this syndrome. Um, and that's why I make the statement here that even in the absence of overt my myositis, uh, we uh, have to be vigilant for this. Okay. So finally, once we make a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease or one of these other pulmonary complications, what, what are the cornerstones of management? And before we talk about medications, again, I want to emphasize that it's really um, key to assess and manage other coexisting factors which may be negatively impacting lung function. So, we have to ask our patients about reflux, which may not always be 
uh, signified by heartburn. Very often it's silent, and, the, and one of the key clues to that um, can be a cough that's more pronounced at night than during the day. And the reason for that is that when we lie flat at night in our sleep and can't protect our airway, if we're having silent reflux held up in the stomach, and where do you think it goes? It can get down into the lungs, and that can trigger a cough. And if, so if someone has a, if we get the story that someone has a cough and it's really significant at night, we immediately think of reflux, which it sounds like such a trivial problem with heartburn, but yet it can be a, a very vexing problem. We at least have to, even though it's rare, we have to look for pulmonary artery hypertension, um, and we, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment how we do that. And then always, always, this really should be at the top of this list, we always have to think about infection, again, particularly once people are already on therapy. So what are the medications that we use? Um, you know, 50, 60 years after the advent of steroids, even with the discovery of all these other immune suppressing medications, steroids are still the mainstay of therapy, at least initially. And they work very well. They work more quickly than all these other drugs. But the problem is the other side of the coin, really, that over time, and I'm sure many of you can uh, testify to this, there are really troubling side effects which ultimately can limit the, the long-term use of, of steroids or create problems which, albeit different, are just as bad as the disease. And so we never, uh, it, it goes without saying that we never want to be administering treatments where side effects ultimately outweigh the, the, the impact of the disease. So in an attempt to better control disease and hopefully limit the amount of steroid that we use over the long run, we now have a number of other um, drugs which I would collectively call anti-metabolites because they impair the metabolism of the immune cells which are mediating the disease. We now have a number of drugs, so Celsept, Imuram, or Azathioprine, Prograf, the other name for that is Tacrolimus, or FK506. Sometimes we still have to use cyclophosphamide, which is Cytoxan, another very powerful agent, but also one with um, risk of serious side effects that limit our ability to use it over time. We, we live in an era now um, where we have a huge number of so-called biologic agents, um, things like manufactured or recovered <coughs> antibodies, like rituximab, um, which, you know, I'm sure most of you are aware there has been a very large trial looking at rituximab as a treatment for myositis in general. What we've noticed anecdotally at least, that the, that trial wasn't set up to assess this, is that rituximab may be quite helpful in treating the lung component of not only myositis but other autoimmune diseases. TNF inhibitors like Embryl actually have been disappointing. We, we thought that, that they would be very helpful in the treatment of myositis because TNF is a, is a biological agent, or I mean a natural agent that has been found in diseased muscle, but um, the treatments really don't help with the muscle disease. And in fact, the, some of these medications, it's been suggested that they actually can trigger lung disease. Uh, for reasons which aren't entirely clear. So one of the newest things on the horizon um, are so-called antifibrotic agents. So they're medicines which you may not have heard of, things like perfenidone or ofem, nitetimib. And these are medications which have been <coughs> approved for use in an, another lung condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And that's a disease where there's much less of an inflammatory component to the lung disease than we see in myositis. And it, the problem really is excess um, fibrosis or scar tissue formation. And there's been a, a search for a long time, not only in scarring lung disease, but other autoimmune diseases like scleroderma, 
to look for medications which um, can actually reverse a scar or damage to tissue. And the bottom line is that we really haven't looked at this in any formal sort of way in myositis associated lung disease. So it's not yet clear whether these will be useful drugs in this disease if it progresses to the point where there's honeycombing or scar tissue. Um, and, you know, it's unclear whether medicine from this, a uh, medication from this category could be used in combination with an anti-inflammatory agent to sort of complement each other and better treat the disease. But I, I think that we're going to learn a lot more in the next few years about what the role of these, this class of medications may be in myositis associated lung disease. There's a lot of sort of fervor surrounding the use of stem cells and other cell-based therapies. Uh, I, I think, and, and they're actually being studied, again, in the setting of other types of lung disease, like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But nobody has really studied this in the context of myositis or myositis-associated lung disease. So although I think ultimately this may be a viable approach, we're just not there yet. We, we've not really looked at this in a rigorous way um, to see A, if it works, and B, if there are complications in this setting that really would limit the use of cell-based therapies. So beyond the treatments themselves for the lung disease, because these medications suppress or at least partially suppress the immune system, we always have to worry about infection. So one of the things that there's a particular kind of infection called PJP or pneumocystis, and knowing that it can be promoted by use of these medicines, we often will put people on one of these antibiotic regimens to prevent that particular type of infection from occurring. Um, I think that it's also important, it's crucial in fact that all patients with lung disease, whether or not they're on one of these medications, um, have appropriate vaccinations. So that means getting the yearly flu shot. This is not a live virus vaccine, so there's no risk even if you are on, immune -suppressing med on an immune suppressing medication. And then Prevnar and Pneumovax is, it used to just be Pneumovax, but these are um, vaccinations against bacterial pneumonia. And they don't need to be administered every year. It's every five to ten years, unlike the flu shot, which is different every year. In people with severe lung disease, uh, oxygen may be required. Uh, it may not be required at rest, but only with activity, because as we work and move around, um, there's increased demand for oxygen. And sometimes we don't see the drop in oxygen levels at rest, but we do see it with activity. Uh, there can be a very important role for pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, again, in those people with a more severe end of the spectrum. We <coughs> have to have ways of objectively following the course of disease, particularly once we make the decision to institute treatment. So, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, symptoms are very important. When I see patients, I listen very carefully in terms of how short of breath um, someone might be, how much can they do compared to before, before they get short of breath. Um, do they have a cough? Is it productive? But we also, at least at, at certain intervals, have to get objective tests of lung function. We try not to irradiate our patients too frequently, so we're not you know, in general, I don't advocate getting CAT scans every six months unless there's a change in, in status that warrants looking at the anatomy of them. Uh, and then at every one to two years, we'll often look using, uh, for evidence of pulmonary artery hypertension using an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart, because we have ways of estimating the pressure inside of these, the blood vessels in the lung tissue. If all of our attempts at medication or medical therapy and, and rehabilitation um, are not enough and disease is progressive, we do 
sometimes entertain the possibility of lung transplantation. Uh, obviously, we try and do everything we can short of recommending lung transplantation because while it can be life-saving, there are enough problems associated with lung transplantation that it's not an approach that's appropriate for everyone. And part of that depends upon um, what other medical conditions somebody may have um, that would make them a good or a poor candidate for lung transplantation. Can I ask a question? Sure. I know you talked about the CT scan is not being every six months, but I guess for somebody that has lung disease, how often are you recommending if the PFTs are relatively stable? Like, what would you tell a patient? So, we'll, we'll discuss this more in a minute, but the question was, is there really a defined interval at which we should be looking at, at CAT scans, even if the lung function, let's say, is stable by PFTs? And there's no absolute rule here. And in, in fact, I mean, I see patients with, with my pulmonary colleagues, and we often make the decision to hold off on further imaging unless there's a change in clinical status or the PFTs, the pulmonary function tests show a decline. So it, it really, I mean, at the end of the day, we have to think about how is this going to impact the management. Um, or in the scenario that you described is how likely is it that the lung is progressing anatomically if the pulmonary function tests are stable. And it sort of gets to whether or not you believe that pulmonary function tests are a sensitive enough indicator. But the short answer is that there isn't an absolute requirement for repeated CAT scans. It really is an individual decision based on what's happening um, over time. Okay, thank you. So just one or two more slides and then we'll open everything up for discussion. Um, what do we need, in, at least this is sort of my opinion now, what do we need in the future to uh, improve our understanding of lung disease and the setting of myositis and come up with better treatments so that we don't have to talk about uh, things like lung transplantation. So, one of the important uh, aspects to this is that I really think there has to be more crosstalk between subspecialties, particularly rheumatology, neurology, and, and pulmonary medicine. Um, and while that might seem like an obvious statement, in, the, in reality it doesn't happen all that often. I, I'm fortunate where I am at the University of Miami that we've established a combined uh, pulmonary rheumatology clinic. So along with one of my pulmonary colleagues, we see patients at the same time. We're all in the same room. There can be a lot of hot air in the room, but um, you know, I, I think that you know, that way we ensure that the right hand is talking to the left hand. And I think that, as I'm sure, again, many of you feel the same way, that that's something that isn't always the case and it's sorely needed. We have to, to, to learn more about these diseases, we have to develop better databases, which include not only clinical information, um, but also biological specimens. And the problem here is that, again, we're dealing with what are, in the, in the scheme of things, relatively rare diseases. It's very difficult to study these diseases because you're not, we, there are not enough patients in one area that you can set up a clinical trial in site A and site B. So really what we have to do is combine our, our resources and combine the information that we have Together, but that is predicated on the notion that we're actually collecting the same kind of data. So um, there has to be some standardization in terms of what data are we collecting, what are the outcome measures that we are looking at when we're evaluating the effectiveness of treatment, and um, that has to be the same across centers. Otherwise, there's no way of combining data. And really, that, that's how we get more power um, to analyze whether treatments are effective or not. Um, and so, you know, that, that's really the last point here is that there has to be an open sharing of data uh, in order, I think, in order to move this field forward. So, just this is the last slide. Um, I'm hopefully convinced to you that, um, I don't think I needed to convince you that lung disease in the setting of a rare disease like myositis 
is fairly prevalent. There are multiple ways in which the lung can be involved, both inflammation of the lung tissue itself, interstitial lung disease, but all these other factors like weakness of respiratory muscles and um, infection, etc., that are very important to consider. Uh, especially in cases where someone doesn't have a known diagnosis um, but has predominant lung problems, it's very important that a rheumatologist, I mean, I have a biased perspective, but that a rheumatologist get involved early on to look for subtle clues that permit a more specific diagnosis. And that diagnosis, I think, can be aided by looking at the autoantibodies that we discussed, but also getting appropriate imaging studies, and in some cases, biopsy. This, again, is the summary of the most common treatment regimens, which usually involve a combination of steroids or prednisone and one of the other agents. This is Celsep, microphenolate, tacrolimus, prograf, and cytoxan. Um, not together, but um, one of those agents. Um, and as I said, Along the way, we really have to look out for comorbidities or, or factors which are negatively impacting the treatment of the lung and infection is a big one. So I will stop there and um, really open the floor to all of you. And uh, what we'll try and do, I guess, is uh, pass around the microphone so that everybody can hear the question. So who has questions? <laughs> How often do you recommend a pulmonary function test? So, good question. Um, I would say that probably every six months or so. Again, there's not an absolute rule of how often we should be looking at pulmonary function tests. That's dictated in part upon um, whether things really are seemingly stable or not. But at least that's a relatively non-invasive way of getting objective information. And then, as I said before, if the pulmonary function test indicated decline in lung function, then we might say, well, do we need to get another CAT scan or imaging study to see what's going on? Slideshow be uploaded on the TMA website? I think so. Okay. <clears throat> I, I heard a nasty rumor that um, from a previous year that there was a YouTube video. So <laughs> not that I'm, I'm in any way. <laughs> my, my, my family likes to make fun of me. I have some nephews and nephews that found this and they, they have not stopped making fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I am not lying about it. <laughs> But yes, I, I think the slide should be on the TMA website. The um, auto antibody testing, yes. is there like a set number of things that are being looked for, or is it dependent on the patient? So I don't think I've had that done. Can all of you hear me so that you don't have to run back and forth with the microphone? <laughs> So the question really is, um, really, what, what profile of autoantibodies should we look at and should everybody get the same panel? Um, the, I don't know that there's a right answer for this. I mean, my bias is that people with myositis should get specialized autoantibody testing because it carries such important um, prognostic information that really can influence the way that we treat patients. Um, so, and just as an example of that, if if I have somebody who presents just with myositis, we'll put lung disease aside for the moment, um, and I know that they have Joe one antibody, I'm going to, number one, immediately do some screening tests for lung disease, even if they're not symptomatic. But number two, from the very beginning, instead of just using steroids alone, I'm going to use steroids with another medication because I know, I mean, not, not, the, as a field, we know that patients with those antibodies are 
likely to have a progressive course or be refractory resistant to treatment with steroids alone. So it's very helpful, I think, to the patient and to the physician making treatment decisions to have that information. The problem is that these tests aren't universally available, especially once you get beyond the ANA and Joe one for example. There are now some specialty labs that are covered by most insurances that run myositis panels and look. And I, you know, I have no vested interest. I'm not going to mention any names because I'll get in trouble. Um, I mean, I have no financial interest, but I actually believe that that is a valuable tool um, in the way that we approach this problem. And my question is, like, if you have a, um, a overlapping, like I have the antibody SRP along with PM, um, and I also have the um, the lung disease and like the connective tissue disease, they say, which just comes from the myositis. But they were telling me that uh, my interstitial uh, lung disease is coming from methotrexate, and um, now I'm trying to figure out, like, um, should I talk to my doctor about, like, including a biological agent or something to, like, treat that or something? So you raise a very important question and one that comes up frequently, and that is, um, what is the role of methotrexate in treating myositis patients when there's lung disease because we worry that methotrexate itself can cause an inflammatory response to the lungs and cause problems. And it is a tough issue. Um, it's true that methotrexate can cause lung inflammation, but in many cases it's being used in conditions where the condition itself can be linked to lung disease. And so it's very often hard to sort of attribute causality. Is it really the methotrexate that's causing it? And I, I mentioned this this morning in the earlier presentation that for as much as we talk about methotrexate related lung disease, I don't think I've seen in, in over 20 years, I've not seen five cases that I'm convinced are due to lung disease, I mean due to methotrexate. I think that we I mean, it's appropriate to worry about it, but the reality, practically speaking, I don't think it's a big um, or a frequent problem. Now, the, we, we sidestep the, the issue in many cases because we now have so many other medications that we can use to treat myositis and myositis lung disease and avoid that issue, you know, avoid muddy in the water. So I think, um, and, and one of the things we commonly use is cell sept. I mean, that's, uh, even though the reality is we don't have a, a, a ton of uh, data really supporting that decision, I think that many people in the field are using CELSEPT and um, And then you mentioned biologic agents. Um, there, there is some anecdotal data, meaning small case series looking at rituximab. Oh. Bless you. If, if, if you're if you're asking me which one I would recommend over the other, that's a tough decision. I mean, typically in my practice, along with the pulmonologist, I would start with cell step before going to rituximab, but uh, I don't necessarily have any data to firmly back up that decision. So I don't think it's wrong to, to think about maybe using rituximab as a, as a substitute. And the other thing we haven't really mentioned here because it gets a little more complicated, is that we can use some of these things in combination. It's not always either or, um, particularly when you're talking about not just my sites, but other organs like the lung involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have DM and ILD. Um, 12 years and I've been on cells up and IVIG. My ILD has not progressed very far. Um, so I'm wondering what the long-term um, 
outcome would be for me, since it's not like progressing, but I have like the crackling at night time, the um, shortness of breath, stuff like that. But it's not to an extent that it's really hindering me now. So is that something that I can just carry with me for the rest of my life, or is that something that could possibly just pop up and say, okay, it's over? Still the microphone back so that everybody can really answer that question. So another good and important question, and that you know, the way that I would sort of summarize that is, you know, how do we view lung disease when you're on medication, it's seemingly stable, life isn't perfect, but at least it doesn't seem to be rapidly progressing or getting worse. So a couple comments to make. Um, stability obviously is good. Um, that the fact that your lung disease is controlled means that that probably in the lung run is not going to be a life-limiting factor, also good. Um, doesn't mean, though, that you're out of the woods because we know that there are certain patients who are steady and then there can be sometimes something that triggers a drop-off. I think that's less likely to occur given that you're on therapy. It'd be more of a concern if you, let's say, went off treatment that things could then change. And so then the question comes up, um, how long can you remain in drugs like Cellcept? The short answer is we don't know, but we, we know from the transplant arena where we stole these drugs from that patients can be on medication for more than 10 years like methotrexate. So that, that's an important point to, to remember is that at least it's something that unlike Cytoxan, where we don't use it for 10 years in a row, um, cell stuff is something that can be used as sort of a maintenance therapy to hopefully keep things stable. Um, and I, I would say the general rule is the longer that you go without change, the less likely you are to have, you know, out of the blue something um, trigger a, a, a serious flare. But it's possible, I mean, if you get superimposed infection. So that's why, you know, getting yearly vaccination, making sure you're up to date on the Pneumovax series, it's critical because you don't want to have anything else superimposed on the underlying disease to, to change what has been, you know, all things considered, a good outcome for you at this point. Nobody wants this disease, obviously, but better to have stable disease than aggressive disease. We charge for more than one question, so. <laughs> Put it on the tab. I have been diagnosed with uh, PM and the interstitial lung disease. And I have a question about the medications. Uh, first, they was going to do, you know, I was on, I'm on prednisone, and they were going to add the cell set. Well, I'm new to all this, so I was just kind of leery about all these medications. So then when I, when he, they in, introduced the cell set, they told me about it, and I said, I don't know. So then they put me on Plaquenil. And I want to know, does the Plaquenil help with this? Because in the other class, they said that that's usually for DM and not really for polymyositis. Should I go with the cell step and the steroids, or should I continue with the Plaquenil and the steroids? So, so again, the question is, what, what combination of medications is most appropriate for your situation? And um, first of all, they're not mutually exclusive. So in certain situations, you could be in all of those. And because they have different mechanisms of action, in that case, the side effect profile does not overlap. So it's not like you're more likely to have a side effect being on a combination of plaque funnel, let's say, and cell cell. But it really, the, the, ultimately, the medications that we choose depend upon what your particular problems are, I mean, with the disease. Plaquenil is going to have no impact on the lung disease, good or bad. It's just, it's not something that really is effective at treating lung disease. It may be effective for skin disease or joint involvement in the setting of myositis. So, you know, what I'm saying basically, it depends. I mean, if you have myositis and lung disease without a lot of skin and joint involvement, I don't think you need Plaquenil. Um, 
even though it's a relatively safe medicine, every medicine has possible side effects. And if you don't need something, obviously you want to limit the amount of medicine you're on. But if you have, let's say, active dermatomyositis with skin and lung, I think that there could be a role for combinations with Plaquenil and then, but something else that more directly addresses the lung involvement because Plaquenil alone is, is not going to be effective in lung disease. Some of the myositis patients have uh, uh, hoarseness, and is that due to the uh, reflux or medication or a combination of both? And is the main way to treat that um, medications like Pepsid or? So the question is about. <laughs> hoarseness of voice and what, what's the cause and how do we treat it. And so the most common cause in myositis would be reflux, causing vocal cord irritation and hoarseness. The vocal cords are usually not directly involved in the myositis itself. Um, so we look for secondary problems like reflux and that would by far and away be the most common um, factor or, or, or culprit here. And the treatment, medication-wise, we usually use medications in a slightly different class, what we call the, the PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. That would be like Prilosec or Omeprazole, Nexium. Medications like Pepsid and Zantac are also acid blockers, but they're not as effective for reflux um, as um, the, the other agents, you know, the, the purple pill, Prilosec things like that. But I would also make the point that treating reflux is much more than just using these medications. There are lifestyle modifications, dietary modifications that we advocate which help to limit the amount of acid which is being produced by the stomach. So avoidance of um, all the good stuff, not too much caffeine, chocolate, fatty foods, alcohol, um, all those are things that can promote acid production. So um, limiting that's very key, but perhaps one of the most important things um, is leaving at least three hours between when you last eat or drink at night and then go to sleep. Because once you go horizontal you, you're, and you're asleep, your body has no way of voluntarily protecting the airway. I mean, it's obviously anything that's in the stomach you know, once you lie down, you can come back up again. So that's the three hour, that's the reason behind the three hour rule. You want the stomach as empty as possible when you're going to sleep to um, limit the amount of material which can be reflexed and then irritate both pores or get down into the lungs. Considerations if you do have a cyst on your vocal cords um, about taking the improv or, or just are we ordinary patients when it comes to that? So, of course, it depends what is the cause of the cyst, but if you presume that it's, it's a nodule or cyst from chronic inflammation from reflux, I think that. It can be removed, potentially, but that decision is influenced by what medications you're on. So the surgeons never like to do procedures or when you're on prednisone or other medications which may make you more prone to infection or impair wound healing from the surgical procedure. Um, so really, it, it, it's easy to say it's harder to do it, but the biggest thing is really controlling the underlying precipitating factors like the reflux. Um, but I, I think that if the reflux is controlled and you're on a minimum of medication, then yes, you know, if you have a arrows and throat doctor you trust, um, then it's possible to do surgery. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And, you know, maybe if you're someone like Adele, they'll do it for free, but, you know. <laughs> I can do it with this. Do you find that most pulmonologists these days are familiar with myositis? I know the doctor that I've used in the past, I was the first patient he had ever seen with that, so I'm not sure he was aware of all of these different things that you mentioned as far as finding lung disease. Other than, you know, my lung function tests were all fine, and that's usually all he did. You're getting your work done. Um, so, this may not be politically correct to say this, but I would say the answer to your question is no. That most pulmonologists, particularly in the community, um, are not used to seeing patients with myositis. That we see a lot of patients who are referred in from the community, from the community pulmonologists who have been labeled as pulmonary fibrosis or, um, you know, and that actually, if, if someone is being referred in, at least there's some recognition on the part of the pulmonologist that maybe it isn't just that. But, um, and, and I, I make the statement only because my colleague who is a pulmonologist says just exactly what you, or echoes what you have said, that, that the problem is lack of awareness. And, and the truth is it's not just pulmonologists, there are plenty of rheumatologists and neurologists who are not really comfortable with or familiar with these kinds of complications. So um, that that's, you know, what I was saying before, clinical index of suspicion is how do we raise that, you know, in the medical community as a whole. And I think it's evolving though. I think that um, in general the relationship between interstitial lung disease and, and any autoimmune disease, that, that, that recognition is growing in pulmonary circles and rheumatology circles. Uh, because there's increasing amount of crosstalk, but that's more likely to occur in an academic or university-based center than it is in the community, and that's not to denigrate in any way. Um, you know, there are plenty of good doctors, pulmonologists, rheumatologists in, that practice in the community, but it's because it's, it's such so rare, relatively rare, maybe not as rare as we think, but relatively rare, um, you know, if you don't see patients, enough patients with these kinds of problems, then you're going to miss it. I mean, the same thing is true of me for something else. That, that you know, if I, if I haven't seen a lot of cases of something that's not on my radar, I'm going to miss the diagnosis. Is there any way to find a pulmonologist easily? Because you know how you pay your money and go see one after the other. Right. So, so my general suggestion for that is if you live in an area where there's a, there is an academic center relatively close by a university, look on their website. You go into pulmonologists and, and you, you look at what their specialized areas of interest are and, and you know there are sub sub specialists meaning there are pulmonologists who specialize in interstitial lung disease. And and people like that are much more likely to be in tune with these kinds of issues. And and be able to help you distinguish lung disease associated with an autoimmune disease from the geopathic lung fibrosis. Hello, this is, um, let's see, PM with JL1 antibody. Uh, as a, I'm sure you answered this already, I'm not sure, but is a pulmonary function test, if it's been good all along, is it? Can I assume that everything's okay? So, um, and I have another question too. I have a rheumatologist that, that internship at, at John Hopkins University, and when we go to him, all he does is a stethoscope, and he says they're all clear. It sounds good. Can I assume that everything's okay? Well, it's Hopkins, so it must be so. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I know, I actually am friends with all the people that are in Hopkins, but, um, but in, in, so I, I think the, the more serious answer to your question is that um, I think that pulmonary function tests are pretty reliable. There's no such thing as a perfect test, but if the PFTs are done properly and they indicate stable lung function, then I think 
that you can have some reassurance that things are stable um, and that you know, there's not some lurking problem. I mean, I think that, as we said before, that even when things are going well, that polymer tests should be repeated at some interval in the six to 12 months. Um, there is a role for, for exam. I mean, if, you know, our ears aren't perfect, but if you have no crackles on exam, then it's much less likely that you have severe lung disease. But you have to be progressed to a certain level before we can appreciate that by examination. So I think the combination of a good clinical exam um, and pulmonary function tests is, that is reliable. And, and that's why we say that, you know, I don't believe that everybody needs to have a CAT scan at a, a defined interval if those other tests and clinical assessments are good. I have a follow-up question to the question I had before about CELSEP. Um, you said something about being on it open for over 10 years, I've been on it for 12. Is there a limit of how long I could go on CELSEP or can I do that forever as long as I'm not having any side effects, which I have not had any? Second question I have is concerning the acid reflux. Um, I was on PPIs, I got off because of memory loss, and I'm taking the Zantac, which is working, but it's not as good as the PPI. Um, my concern is the acid reflux causing cancer, esophageal cancer, if it's not controlled. And what symptoms do I need to look for for that, if I would have any symptoms for cancer? So first, with respect to the duration of therapy with CELSEP, there's no absolute limit, so I think that if you're doing well, if your labs are being monitored, which would be CBC and a metabolic profile for liver enzymes, if that looks good, um, and if you're up to date on your general cancer screening measures, then I think it's fine to continue that. I mean, if you need it. Um, there's a theoretical concern with any immune suppressing drug over time that you are somewhat more prone to certain types of blood malignancy, lymphoma, or leukemia, and that's because we need our intact immune systems to be good, um, you know, um, s sentinels of, of or, or our immune system is needed for, for tumor surveillance basically to recognize and eliminate potentially cancerous cells before they develop into a tumor. That's not completely impaired when you're on cell set, but it's your ability to do that is weaker, so we, we always worry about that at least theoretically, but again, to borrow from the transplant experience where people that are having patients on these medications for long term seems to be okay. Now, the issue of you know reflux and are you compromised because you're on Zantac instead of a proton pump inhibitor, I think it's, again, I think it's fine. That, that it's not that Zantac doesn't work. I think if you take these other reflux precautions, you're going to limit the, the negative impact of reflux. And in terms of whether you're at risk for esophageal cancer, if, if, if reflux is controlled, and then the answer is you're not at risk, but you, you need to consult at some point with you know, your gastroenterologist. And so what they look for, um, you know, if, if there's some concern that the reflux is not controlled, then they would do an endoscopy to look. And if they see changes in the tissue, they would do biopsies to look for first what we call Barrett's esophagitis, which can be a precursor, not always, but can be a precursor to, to cancer. But the, the likelihood of getting esophageal cancer from reflux is pretty low unless you have severe and really totally uncontrolled reflux. So, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you not to worry about it, but I don't see that as a problem even with the changes in the medicines that you've had to make. I know there's other anti jo one people in here, so I hope this is helpful. If a patient shows up with uh, anti jo one positive, the PFT ratios are generally in the 50s and 60s and the CT scan shows some reticulation and ground glass. Does that person have ILD or is that just a monitor situation? 
can assume that person is you. Um, <laughs> but, no, no. I, I think that is interstitial lung disease. Um, I, I mean, by definition, if, if we see abnormalities of pulmonary function and corresponding changes on the CAT scan, so for those of you who are not radiologists, reticulation is just a description of a pattern. Literally, it looks like lace or reticulation on the on the CAT scan. It's not quite the same thing as ground glass pacification, but it's basically inflammation of the tissue. Um, that, that is interstitial lung disease. Now, prognostically speaking, you know that doesn't mean it's going to be progressive, depending upon the treatment that you're on and, and the relative stability. So, you alluded to the fact that there is a reduction in the what we call the percent predicted um, you know, vital capacity, force vital, vital capacity, and some other parameters. So, you know, what I would say, based on just the limited information that you told me, is that you have moderately restrictive disease, moderately restrictive interstitial lung disease. So, what I would suggest at this point. Um, just because I know that there are other sessions starting at 11, is that we end the official part of this. I'll certainly stay here for a few more minutes to answer additional questions if you want to ask. And um, hopefully, you found this somewhat useful and, and that you enjoy the rest of the conference.